I'm aware that in the course of last couple of weeks, you may have seen already quite a few webinars on COVID-19 infodemic, and I have seen several myself. And you might wonder what would make this one stand out. Our aim is to change slightly the focus from the um, tactics and the trends uh, applied by the Beijing and Moscow and to shed more light on the impact on these operations are having on our societies, the role of non-state actors trying to capitalize on the current crisis and most importantly to discuss what should be done about it at the national level, at the level of EU and what should be the role of other actors, be it social media companies, journalists or NGOs. I have the pleasure to moderate today's webinar with a panel of experienced experts from both sides of the Atlantic. And let me briefly introduce them. Graham Brookie, Director of the Digital Forensic Research Lab in Washington, DC. Anneli Ahonen, Head of East Stratcom Task Force from the European External Action Service. Sasha Havlicek, CEO of Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. And last but not least, we have Peter Krekel, Director of Political Capital Institute in Budapest. We would like to make this webinar as interactive as possible. So please use the opportunity and ask our panelists questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. You can also upload other participants' questions. Let me start with Graham. Graham, DFR Lab has been following COVID-19 developments from the very beginning and covered countries across the globe from Armenia to Italy, Mexico, up to South Africa. What are the current trends in COVID-19 infodemic? Do you see a one-size-fits-all approach or rather a tailor-made campaign using local vulnerabilities and wedge issues? Graham. Thanks so much, Daniel, and thanks so much uh, to everybody for joining this morning. Uh, we're extremely uh, happy to be a safe, uh, healthy, and and the normal amount of sane uh, as we look at this infodemic. So thanks everybody for joining. I hope that you're uh, safe and and from a at least safe social distance uh, as the first and best practice uh, that's been given to us by uh, the World Health Organization and CDC and others. Uh, my name is Grant Brookie. I'm the director and managing editor, as Daniel said, of the Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council. Uh, and as of right now, we have teams on five continents that are kind of looking at the information environments. And to Daniel's point, uh, this is not only a global event, but it plays out in very personal and hyper-local ways. And so the information that I have here in Washington, D.C., is a little bit different than even the information that's in the next neighborhood over or the next town over. And so that is uh, one of the challenges in looking at this infodemic. Uh, and so I'll start with a, a few terms. Infodemic is particularly informative. I, I know that it's a term that's in the title of this event. I know that it's a term that a lot of the kind of counter disinformation community is using right now, but we find it to be particularly helpful. Where it came from was uh, an assessment that was given by the World Health Organization on February 2nd. And it's defined as an overabundance of information, uh, some good and some bad, or some accurate and some not, that leads to uh, people being uh, more, uh, to be more challenging in order to get trusted and reliable sources of information and guidance when people need it. And so take that as an informative term, uh, what we're seeing is kind of a flood of information from all sides. And so at the DFR lab, we don't use the term fake news. It turns out it's not a very good research term. It's, it's, it has a lot of connotations. It's overly political uh, and it's hard to measure. We do use the term misinformation, which is the spread of false information without intent. That's a little bit more passive, a little bit more pervasive. Uh, it's something that we all likely have a family member that does every once in a while. Uh, right, the, the headline that they didn't actually read the article of, but they shared it anyways. And we see a ton of misinformation uh, about COVID-19. As an example, uh, there's a case in the United States uh, right before uh, New York City, which is one of the hardest hit areas in the United States, uh, went on essentially work from home or self-quarantine for the entire city. And there were a lot of text messages that were sent around that said, Hi, my you know brother or you know sister's boyfriend or close connection uh, is 
working at the Department of Defense or working at the Department of Homeland Security, and they, I have it on good information that they're about to shut down the entire city and close the bridges and all these things. Please share. Now, of course, that was not true, uh, but it reached a lot of people by text message in a very short amount of time because of that call to action, that, that please share. So that's the case of misinformation. Uh, and we also see a bunch of disinformation. That's the spread of false information with intent uh, in three buckets. And that's the geopolitical that we typically see. That's where we would typically put like influence operations. And we see a, a truly global kind of a competition for narratives around coronavirus, including from China, including from Russia, that we'll dive into on this conversation. Uh, we also see ideological. And those actors could be uh, domestic or international. Uh, but spreading misinformation for the uh, to push one particular ideology, whether that's political or or religious or or what have you, and most importantly, I think we see a lot of economic disinformation. That's where I am public health disinformation specifically, and that can be at a small scale. That's the spread of false information for economic gain at a small scale, including you know the, uh, Facebook users trying to sell snake oil cures and things of that nature. Uh, you know, if you drink hot water, you're going to be uh, immune from coronavirus. That's not true. Uh, but we see a lot of kind of narratives like that uh, at scale across social media uh, and in general, as well as large scale economic disinformation. And that's where in the middle of a global pandemic, the markets are very volatile and subject to information consumption at scale. And so uh, the term, the financial term for it is short and distort or pump and dump where you where you create a false narrative and then it moves the market in another direction so that you can gain financial uh, financially at scale and so we see a good amount of that as well which is particular concern going forward that's a bit of the kind of categories that we're seeing across the world i'm happy to go into specific cases uh, one other thing before i pass it back to daniel that we are seeing quite a bit of uh, that frankly, it plays more into those that geopolitics of coronavirus is information suppression. And in a pandemic where good information gets people the best uh, guidance in order for them to make decisions about their own health, their own lives, and their livelihoods, uh, information suppression can be just as dangerous as disinformation or false information. And so there, you know, cases like uh, Chinese government suppressing the number of cases uh, or not being as transparent about the number of cases outright uh, during you know the initial spread in January, uh, that led to an exponentially worse public health problem. And so information suppression is just as dangerous as disinformation. And so I hope that that's a useful overview. Again, happy to dive into any uh, specific cases that our team from around the world is looking at. But again, thank you very much for, for having this conversation today. Thank you, Graham. I think it was uh, very useful to have this uh, general overview, even though in the next phase of the discussion, we'll be moving more towards the impact and how these different types of disinformation, misinformation, or suppression of information are having negative impact on the state of democracy and democratic uh, uh, policies of our, our countries. Let me now move on to, to Anneli. Uh, Anneli, your team has recorded more than 150 cases of uh, Russia originated disinformation concerning COVID-19 since January. Last week, EAS published an update to its report on narratives uh, on, and disinformation around the COVID-19 pandemic. What are the most important highlights? What are the main changes uh, since January? Did the narratives evolve? And if so, how? Anneli, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, here today. Uh, good afternoon from Brussels. Um, uh, so my name is Anneli Ahonen. Uh, I'm the head of uh, the team called East Stratcom Task Force, uh, part of EU's External Action Service um, and uh, Strategic Communication and Information Analysis division uh, that published uh, the reports about uh, the assessment of, of disinformation around uh, coronavirus and, and the updated report 
uh, from last week. Um, so if I would now use my uh, introductory words uh, to briefly describe the, the main outcomes of the reports and then we can move on in the discussion to, to the impact and, and the follow-up. Uh, so our analysis, um, uh, especially regarding uh, Russia's disinformation, is based on uh, monitoring of uh, Russian uh, outlets or outlets that clearly have a link to uh, Russia in more than 20 languages. In the biggest European languages, uh, Eastern Partnership countries languages, uh, in the Western Balkans and in Arabic as well. Uh, so if we see how the narratives have de uh, developed, um, in a way, what we started seeing in January uh, was a normal situation for this pro-Kremlin disinformation ecosystem uh, is that whenever um, uh, this kind of crisis happens, uh, they will start exploiting it, jump on it, using it opportunistically, uh, relying on existing messages, existing narratives that are out there. Uh, in this case, um, uh, especially for the Russian domestic audience, it meant uh, framing uh, uh, the, the crisis that the virus has uh, produced as um, something that is uh, comes from a foreign aggressor. Uh, this included messages that the uh, virus is a man-made virus uh, originating in uh, uh, typically in US uh, uh, run secret laboratories. Uh, and this uh, is a narrative that has a history that has al already an audience out there uh, so it's easy to, to start uh, exploiting. Uh, when it comes to the um, international audiences in different local languages, um, there the focus was more on, uh, on, on different types of narratives about the deep state, about the global elites uh, that are um, using the virus to advance their own, um, uh, own aims and own, own goals. Uh, and now when we are uh, again, uh, both the health uh, crisis, uh, both inside Russia, uh, in Europe, um, is, is in a totally different level than it was in January. Uh, we can also see development on the, on the disinformation side. Uh, so what has happened uh, in, the, in the international uh, audience side is that we can see more and more uh, false health uh, advice or promoting of miracle uh, cures type of messages popping up uh, and for the for the domestic audience, uh, maybe it's worth no, uh, noticing that in the beginning, uh, especially the Russian language state TV uh, had uh, or continued to focus on Ukraine uh, and its uh, failures in tackling uh, the crisis. But during the past days, uh, this Ukraine focus uh, has not been that high on the agenda. Uh, potentially implicating that uh, it would, in the current uh, circumstances, backfire with the, with the Russian domestic audience. We will continue updating the reports, um, and now I will uh, give the floor uh, back to, to Daniel, and then we, we can uh, continue with the impact part. Thank you. One additional question, Anneli, if I may. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about China using the Russian playbook and how Chinese for the first time perhaps are using the same approach that the Russians have been using since 2014 at least. Do you see in your research, in your reporting, any collaboration or support between Russian and Chinese outlets? I know that EAS is following uh, mostly Russian outlets, but have you come across any, any interesting you know, support or signs of collaboration between the two? So we have started uh, focusing more on, uh, more on China as well. Um, but on this part, uh, I would like to, to mention the, the partners, uh, great uh, work on this. I think that the, it's, it's really worth following Hamilton uh, 2.0 um, uh, tracker uh, and see how the, how the Russian and, and Chinese tactics coincide. I think that what we can, uh, clearly see um, is that these um, apart from the from the like self promotion of of uh, uh, aid uh, campaigns that both uh, China and Russia have been doing but when it comes to to clear disinformation uh, side um, 
where where these where these disinforming interests uh, of both Russia and China uh, meet and coincide is is the message about the virus originating um, somewhere outside China, uh, usually uh, in the U.S. And here we can also we have seen also amplification of um, some outlets uh, that. Uh, usually push pro Kremlin disinformation and then uh, get amplified uh, by by Chinese officials. That's definitely an interesting angle uh, to the whole situation. And now uh, let me move to uh, to Sasha. Uh, Sasha, ISD is well known for its research and activities providing understanding and uh, responses to the rising tide of polarization, hate and extremism of all forms. Your report on EP elections last year um, and the disinformation campaigns also created a lot of buzz. ISD recently launched its COVID-19 disinformation briefing looking into conspiracy theories, mobilization of hate mongers and extremists amid uh, the pandemic. What are the key insights and how are non-state actors trying to use the current situation? Daniel, thank you so much for having me on. And may I just uh, apologize? I think my internet connection is a little unstable. And just to make sure that the, that the voice isn't cracking up, I'm going to stop the video for now and come back with the video on for the conversation, if that's okay. Um, okay sure. So just to say, yes, as, as you mentioned uh, kindly, we've, uh, we've been monitoring uh, and turning our digital analysis unit to look at the intersection of COVID disinformation um, and the disinformation that we see from that constellation of actors uh, that we've seen very lively across elections um, internationally. Um, in particular across Europe and the West uh, of late, but also around specific issue sets um, where they've been particularly uh, actively doing their information operations um, with a view uh, to undermining uh, democratic, liberal democratic frames of reference and democratic process, um, indeed liberal democratic culture. Uh, I, I won't touch on the parts of the report um, that look at the state, uh, state actor engagement, but I, I think it'd be interesting to look at the interplay later on. Let me just say a few words now about what we're seeing in terms of non-state actor mobilization. And perhaps in the wider conversation later, we can touch on what we see in terms of the platform response and what that signifies in terms of platform policy and regulation going forward. Uh, again, I think a really important uh, piece of the conversation to take on now uh, uh, during this crisis. So very quickly, uh, you know, it is not, surprising it's not new that uh, extremist groups hate groups exploit crises to push their agendas and ideologies and, and in many ways this is the mother of all crises and so what we have seen with our research um, both across mainstream and alternative platforms is that there were early and have been consistent um, attempts to mobilize um, uh, in terms of spreading harmful and hateful messaging um, now the anti-migrant and far-right networks are doing what they do. They're exploiting COVID-19 to spread uh, disinformation, targeting migrants and refugees. We've seen specific flashpoints around the US, Mexico and Turkey, Greek borders, specific targeted uh, disinformation in relation to Jews and Muslims. White supremacist groups are making explicit threats. We need to be very uh, mindful of this, um, of violence and harm to non-white populations. We've already seen a Missouri man killed by the FBI plotting an attack on a hospital with COVID patients who'd previously been uh, wishing to attack a school and mosque and so on. Um, we see continued calls within these extreme um, uh, environments on Telegram and the sort of alt tech spaces that these groups mobilize for attacks on public services such as hospitals. Uh, for calls for those with the virus to turn themselves into bioweapons and to target non-white non constituencies. Accelerationism uh, within far-right uh, circles, it's uh, important to mention, this is, this is the concept of promoting the idea that democracy is a failure and we, we should be accelerating its end, its downfall, the downfall of the state. 
this idea has gained a lot of traction in, in these months. And the concept of boogaloo, which is a reference within far right circles to civil war, the civil war they want to see happen in the United States is starting to gain not just sort of fringe, but also mainstream traction. So you see um, that uh, concept getting um, mentioned sort of 200,000 times across social media in, in February and March, 52% of which is on Twitter. So it's not just the um, nether regions of the internet, but really in, in, in the broad mainstream. 22% uh, of that on Reddit and so on, but beyond the 4chans and votes and so on of this world. It, I mean, these sorts of environments, crazy as they may seem, you know, Facebook groups such as um, the Big Igloo Bois and Boogaloo Bois, uh, which you know, respectively have 22,000 followers and 6.5 thousand followers, have seen major spikes in their engagement uh, rates, which is also concerning, you know, from 88% spike last month to 215% spike in engagement around those areas. It is important, I think, for us to start to think in terms of what implications this will have in terms of public safety uh, violence. QAnon has bizarrely started also breaking through into the mainstream um, with, it, with the adrenochrome concept. And we've seen, uh, again, mainstreaming both with Fox and also with Donald Trump's retweeting of QAnon influencers in, in, in unhelpful ways. And the broad narratives are sort of anti-government anti overreach, of course, racist, anti-Chinese, anti-migrant, anti-Semitic, a lot of terrorist tropes and conspiracy theories that bleed, I think, is clear. The, the relationship with state actor mobilization, I, I mean, it, of course, there is no coordination there, but this kind of um, information uh, operation runs adjacent and is aligned in terms of the sort of key meta-narratives, that is, the delegitimization of liberal dem democratic government, sowing mistrust in democratic process, in internationalism, in, you know, it's anti-globalist, it's pro-nationalist in its agenda, it's pro-authoritarian. I mean, there are all of those sort of meta streams that align and support and sometimes amplify what you see coming out of the state uh, propaganda uh, operations that, that uh, Graham and Annalie have just talked a little bit about. I, I think in terms of, you know, broader trends, this is, you know, it's in line with the trends that we see in terms of this constellation of non-state actors from neo-libertarian and extreme, you know, to the extreme right, um, going well beyond agitating around elections, um, which they've done very consistently in favor of populist and far-right political parties, really, you know, it, investing in the long range in information around, uh, information operations around the, the key international progressive policy agenda issues of our time around migration, around climate, around the rights and equalities agenda, and around the public health, in particular reproductive health agenda, which we see now on an ongoing basis. And in a way, this is part of that longer term cultural change project that they see themselves invested in um, uh, with, with a view to sort of undermining democratic civic culture as well as democratic institutions. So I think that those are things to keep in mind. You've asked me to uh, look at who else, you know, are there, is there a sort of political agenda being pursued here uh, beyond these extreme groups? I'd say, you know, who's using the, the COVID epidemic politically? Sort of everybody. <laughs> and whether, whether it is um, the awful sectarian mobilization across the Middle East that we see today, uh, and, uh, you know, those divides being stoked, uh, fanned in, 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 many, in many ways. Uh, by a combination of state and non-state actors to you know looking at the us i mean we and i think we will see more of this in the lead up to the us elections we are looking heavily at disinformation in the context of the us elections this year uh, you know it's interesting to see i mean slightly outside of the context of covid you know bernie bros and pro trump networks of accounts are both sharing the same content in relation to the biden sexual assault allegations all of that complicated of course by the fact that the woman who made the claims wrote this pro-Putin blog, which in itself could be fake, we're not sure. But those constellations on the hard left and hard right, we will see, I'm sure, more happening there in relation to COVID disinformation. We've certainly seen some of that on the far right. I've mentioned the QAnon sort of mainstreaming into, into the sort of Fox media ecosystem. Um, and I think we'll see some more of that. But yes, I mean, we've seen, you know, after 2016, in a way, that Kremlin playbook got into the hands of everybody, but in, in particular into the hands of 
uh, extreme uh, and hate groups. To some extent, I think we start to see state actors take from some of the playbook of extreme groups, particularly around um, the, the, the propagating of conspiracy theories, which are at the forefront of, of what we see in terms of state propaganda machinery. I think it's also important to note that in terms of the state uh, actor disinformation and misinformation, we see much of it is just state propaganda. Uh, it's overt, it's not covert. Although we've seen some evidence of covert operations around a Chinese network of accounts, but it is overt. And I think here in many ways, we're going back to the sort of slightly more overt fakery, um, uh, overt tactics of uh, perhaps the, you know, the, the, the pre, well, the 2016 period. In terms of health disinformation, I think that that overt fakery has been a consistent factor of health disinformation, so perhaps not such a big change. Um, but yes, those perhaps for now, um, I do think it would be important, and we've done a little bit of looking at what the social media companies have done in this crisis, what, you know, the good, the bad, and, and uh, the ugly, and uh, all of the things that I think we really do need to be focusing on now as a unique opportunity uh, to think about how we get ahead of the curve on disinformation writ large, uh, and build the infrastructure, build the policy infrastructure needed to deal with this problem. I think we've got an opportunity now uh, in ways that we perhaps haven't had before to get around that. Thank you, Sasha. I think you pointed a very important uh, aspect of the whole situation that is perhaps sometimes overlooked. That on one hand, yes, we are faced with uh, consistent uh, approach of uh, China and, and Russia trying to use this crisis uh, for their own geopolitical purposes. But at the same time, there is a homegrown group of you know, either populist or far right, far left uh, extremist actors trying to use uh, the current pandemic and infodemic for their own uh, purposes and to push their own agenda. So yeah, essentially, our democratic system is being attacked from both sides, from the uh, foreign powers using, uh, using this crisis to push their geopolitical agendas and domestic uh, uh, extremist forces. Now, let me move to, to Peter. Uh, Peter, um, Political Capital Institute is one of the few remaining uh, independent organizations in Hungary, uh, analyzing disinformation, infops, uh, and democratic backsliding. You recently wrote an excellent piece for, Guard, for Guardian uh, outlining the implications of a recently adopted bill in Hungarian parliament granting government extraordinary powers without any sunset clause. What is the current situation in Hungary? Um, how widespread are Russian and Chinese narratives in Hungary? Peter. Thank you very much, first of all, for having me and thanks for Glapsack and DFR Lab for organizing this event. and. Uh, Good to see good friends among uh, the speakers and even among the participants as well. Um, so in a very nutshell, uh, the Hungarian situation, I would say, is, uh, is on the one hand, rather fits into uh, general international uh, tendencies. Uh, uh, because I, I think it's not only probably a problem in Hungary, that uh, such kind of emergency situations and states of danger, uh, extraordinary uh, legal situations, um, are, can have the danger of, of uh, prevailing longer than, than many expect. So I, I don't think it's, it's necessarily only a problem in Hungary. Of course, we would rather expect that this, this will be more of a problem uh, in uh, authoritarian regimes than among EU member states and among the Western states that, that uh, political leaders can abuse uh, the, uh, the states of uh, emergency. Uh, what is uh, special on the other hand in the, in the Hungarian situation, especially regarding the uh, European context is that, uh, that uh, as I know, uh, Hungary is the only case where there is no sunset close for this um, state of emergency. Uh, and also, it's not only the uh, legal environment that matters, but also the um, practical application of these laws. What we know for sure is the two or, uh, organizations that could, let's say, put a, a counterweight or, or uh, somehow serve as a, as a counterbalance or a check 
against the uh, overpower of the of the government are the parliament and the constitutional court and both of them are rather uh, let's say unable uh, to serve as a as a real check for the simple reason that uh, that uh, they have they won't contradict the government because they are full of loyalists and then fidesz had a two -third, two thirds majority in the in the parliament plus in the constitutional court which rights has been curbed uh, the uh, loyalists of Viktor Orban are, are uh, forming a majority. So uh, I think Hungary is probably uh, an example of how um, the states of danger and this extraordinary situation can be abused for, um, for strength, strengthening the governmental power. And uh, that's why I, I really do think that the international attention that Hungary received in the last uh, last uh, days or weeks is extremely important because despite of the fact what the Hungarian government says that it doesn't matter, it matters. So uh, the governmental stakeholders are, are looking at the feedbacks and, uh, and, they, and they have some kind of impact. So that's why I think this, this um, vigilance is, is uh, quite important. Uh, also, I think Hungary is a, is a prime example of the, of the possible abuse of the fight against disinformation and fake news, which is in, really important to mention. I, I don't think that uh, um, government fighting against disinformation is a problem in itself, by, as some, some think. We all know that uh, disinformation can be, let, uh, can be literally deadly and, and cause lives. And we could see, for example, in Ukraine, or we could see in Iran and elsewhere that false information about COVID-19 can uh, cause violence, can cause life. Uh, Hungarian uh, police, for example, shut down some uh, classical uh, clickbait um, uh, fake news sites, real disinformation sites. Uh, I don't think there is any problem with that. What is a problem, on the other hand, is that there was a, a modification of the penal code in Hungary, uh, on, after which uh, journalists were writing on the problematic or cause uh, public anxiety or so on, they can go for five years uh, to prison. Uh, and why this law has not been used so far, okay, it, it has been just passed, but uh, it's pretty important that there are already quite a lot of threats in the pro-governmental media against specific journalists writing about um, problems of governmental misuse of the, of the virus or, pro sorry, about governmental um, ill treatment of the of the virus, and and there are uh, pro-governmental pundits who are openly threatening journalists, and this is, I think, uh, absolutely a problem. This is an attempt to silence the free press. And also, when it comes to Russian and Chinese disinformation, of course, we have all the narratives that everyone has. Uh, everyone in the audience can recall Russian Chinese disinformation pieces about that. For example, uh, the virus was prepared in US laboratories uh, and, and was brought to China or that the European Union is falling apart and, and uh, it's only China and Russia that treats the virus well and they are helping the whole world. Uh, but the problem in Hungary is that it comes through the mainstream media. So uh, we, could, we could see in the last few years an unprecedented attack against the West, Western institutions, the European Union, also the United States. And, uh, and the general narrative is that we have only friends in Russia, China, uh, and the Turkic nations, uh, for example, Uzbekistan and Turkey. They are helping Hungary, but the European Union not. And we are, done, we are not receiving a penny from the European Union, which is obviously not true. So, the problem is that while the government uh, says that they are fighting hard against disinformation, in fact, um, disinformation is spread via governmental outlets. Also, we could see the narrative that migrants are the primary source of the illegal migrants, of the, of the uh, coronavirus. While I think, for example, Tom Hanks or the spokesperson of, of uh, President Bolsonaro, or for example, Boris Johnson probably didn't have too much direct connection with illegal migrants. So this uh, uh, disease that first attacked rather the elites and the upper middle class cannot really be 
uh, coming from the from the uh, from the illegal migrants. And last, we could see in the last few days another uh, disinformation narrative emerging that the Hungarian currency is is on the decline. And of course, who is to blame for that? George Soros. Uh, so the problem in Hungary is that disinformation, of course, appears in marginal sites, and I don't think it's a problem if the authorities are fighting against that. In, in uh, of course, in a in a uh, rather proportional response, but it's a problem when the government becomes one of the major source of disinformation, and unfortunately, this is uh, this is what the specific uh, feature in the Hungarian disinformation landscape, at least within the European Union context. Thank you, Peter, for this uh, in-depth uh, analysis of situation in Hungary, which also might have uh, you know, much wider consequences as you, as you wrote also in your op-ed in The Guardian. Now I have uh, two questions for all our panelists, and then we will move to uh, questions from our audience. So please try to be brief so that we can also answer some of the questions that we receive from the Q&A. The first question would be, yes, we all know and we have been following uh, different narratives and uh, uh, trends on social media regarding the COVID-19. How big of an impact are these narratives and these stories having? You know, how can you assess the, the implications of this type of content on people's views and opinions? Uh, as far as I know, there is very little uh, evidence and there are no uh, available you know, op opinion polls measuring already the impact of this kind of uh, information operations. But what is, what is your uh, assessment or what would be your, your uh, analysis of the impact that these type of narratives are having on, on people's attitudes? And the second question would be, how do you assess the reaction of the social media and the policies they have enacted? I know that both EAS and ISD uh, have uh, some uh, analysis already. Uh, I saw one part of the report um, put out by EAS that deals with this particular topic, but also to Graham and also Peter, how, how would you assess the reaction and uh, the overall role of social media in the current environment? Graham. Yeah, the role of social media uh, companies in particular, it, you have to realize that, uh, that the pandemic coronavirus itself meets a much higher threshold for content moderation at each one of these companies. And so uh, there's a few challenges that we need to lay out. The first of which, A, this, this topic in particular is a high threshold topic for every single social media company that I have dealt with. Uh, in the course of responding to coronavirus, as well as some of the smaller platforms that we don't typically think about uh, in these conversations, but have a huge, have a very highly engaged user base on health issues in particular. And so the first point is that coronavirus is an issue that everybody can agree on, that you're going to need to take down content or limit certain kinds of behavior on social media. And the by and large, the social media platforms have indicated a a huge degree of willingness to go do that. Now, they're up against a few different challenges. Uh, typically, uh, for a company like Facebook or, or some of the other larger platforms, uh, a lot of the content moderation that happens is done by third-party companies. Uh, and so, it, like you hear about the armies of, of people looking at fake content on on social media platforms. And a lot of those people are working at, at third-party contractors. And so you have this challenge where in order to respect privacy uh, in, uh, with respect to GDPR and other standards around the world, uh, those people can't do the work that they do from home and still guarantee user privacy online uh, without even going into the appropriate mental health and, and work checks that go into looking at like the worst stuff on the internet from home. Uh, and so that's a challenge. Uh, a lot of the social media companies have adopted more, um, for lack of a better word, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to do content moderation on coronavirus. That's something that they've been more transparent about than they have been in the past. Uh, and that's a challenge because if you have a limited workforce, then you're going to need to use some more tools. And so they've had some kind of fits and starts with that. I think that they've moved uh, by and large to those systems faster than they thought they were going to have to. Uh, 
Uh, and so you have a lot of teams that are, that are understaffed and looking at a lot of uh, really, really malicious content online, and that's a challenge. Now, uh, could they be doing more? Could they be doing better? Yes, I think that's, that's an evergreen statement, but I think that uh, by and large, they're, they're working under extreme conditions and, and doing a fairly good job. And there will always be instances where they're going to need to refine policies or refine the ways by which they do that. And so I think that the, the degree to, of willingness by the social media companies has been, has been uh, very forward leaning. Uh, the key question for, for them after the, we get through this pandemic, and I do believe that we will get through this pandemic, uh, is whether those measures of content moderation that they've shown they can do uh, from a decision making and from a technical standpoint will continue to apply to other topics like uh, high threshold topics like they've indicated on the U.S. Census or on kind of lower threshold topics like normal political discourse, even if it is false or polarized. Okay, Anneli, any, any reaction to this? Because I saw one part of your report that deals with this uh, specific question. So if you want to elaborate uh, more from the EAS perspective. I uh, guess yeah, so on the, uh, on the EU level, there are um, a couple of uh, policy processes ongoing uh, already before the, uh, uh, the COVID uh, crisis started. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, Commission's uh, European Democracy Action Plan, uh, which uh, uh, should deal with uh, uh, political advertising on social media uh, on one hand uh, and also on, on uh, election interference on the other hand. Uh, so these processes will uh, be ongoing in the, in the long term and will also tackle the, the issues that will be now uh, growing from the, from the coronavirus. Crisis. Um, in general, uh, I, I can just uh, uh, repeat what Graham uh, just said that we, we have seen um, uh, a lot more willingness from the social media platform side uh, to take down content, to, to tackle the, the uh, false content and manipulated content uh, uh, and, and social media um, uh, campaigns. Uh, compared to, for example, uh, anything that is related to elections. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, a, a good sign. Uh, then on the other hand, we still see that uh, false health advice, uh, misleading, uh, uh, misleading content around coronavirus is still being promoted uh, and shared on social media platforms. So clearly there are uh, still urgent issues that need to be uh, tackled. Um, I think that like many of many of the things that have been uh, in the discussions, like like access to to researchers to data, uh, cross platform uh, sharing of information, to make sure that these these things would be now quickly uh, uh, advanced and uh, progressed, that that would be a first step, and then um, and then uh, in the future to to look for the long term. Uh, solutions. And then on the impact, I think that on uh, coronavirus, it's, it's very clear for everyone uh, that the impact of disinformation is, is so tangible and, and uh, easy for everyone to understand uh, how harmful um, it can be when we talk about <clears throat> this, kind of, uh, this kind of crisis. Uh, some examples may include, uh, for example, in, inside, if we talk about inside Russia, what is happening, the uh, simply the, the messages uh, circulating that, that ginger could help with, uh, with coronavirus uh, resulted in ginger being uh, sold out from the shops and the, the, uh, the cost of it uh, increased and peaked uh, immediately. Uh, and then on the other hand, we haven't seen <clears throat> much of uh, evidence that Russian sources would have been pushing uh, 5G uh, conspiracy theories but then the, uh, in the UK, the vandalized uh, 5G and phone masts uh, after, um, uh, after uh, spread of, of uh, conspiracy theories about connection of 5G with coronavirus is another uh, very clear example of, of the impact, what, what real life uh, impact uh, coronavirus disinformation uh, can have. Thank you.
Thanks. Uh, Sasha, on the social media, as I said, you've been quite vocal and I think also critical in your last EP uh, election report. Uh, if you can also include one of the questions from the chat, uh, what about private messaging platforms, WhatsApp, Telegram, and the others encrypted messaging platforms that are now becoming uh, much more widespread and used, uh, even if we or if the social media companies would enact maybe uh, better policies and measures, people are moving to these closed platforms or even closed groups within social media um, platforms. How, how should we uh, uh, deal with this, these new developments? Yes, absolutely right. I mean, that's where you know, some of the real challenges lie. I think to, just to start by saying, um, I think we've seen them do, the, the social media platforms do, in the first place, an amazingly helpful and uh, important job of elevating, elevating trusted information. And so here you see the power of the social media companies to get, you know, to, to have important, um, relevant and true information breakthrough. So I, I think that's important. We've seen that on one hand. Um, they've also proven, as Graham has said, that they are, that they can react um, at great speed and with great efficacy um, around disinformation. Um, absolutely right, this is a sort of high threshold area of disinformation, but they have done it and they've proven that they can do it in the sense that you've seen a massive culling of disinformation, misinformation off the mainstream platforms, which is not to say that there haven't been problems. What they're showing is that the use of AI can have great impact. It also, of course, comes with a set of problems in that um, it's a higher likelihood of mistakes being made. And, and in reality, of course, because of how stretched they are, processes, transparency processes around redress, for instance, are now not being tended to, which is probably understandable, but needs to be rectified over time. Um, but so we're seeing how far they can go, how fast they can go, how far they can go. And the questions I think after this will be around whether this can or should apply um, to other domains of disinformation. What, what is the significance of this for other areas? They've, they've sort of, there's a watershed moment in a way in relation to their removal of Bolsonaro content. I mean, they have not entered into that political terrain, if you like, of removing disinformation and utterances by political leaders before. Um, and, and so here, in a way, is a watershed moment. Again, questions will be asked as to whether that kind of thing might continue. It didn't happen in relation to other political leaders that may have been propagating other uh, aspects of misinformation, disinformation here, but I think also one to watch. Um, we have seen now in, in relation to the in, you know, alternative platforms, there's no question that, of course, a lot of the worst mobilization, the most racist and extreme mobilization happens on platforms like Telegram, the Chans, the votes of this world. There's, but what I mentioned earlier is that we do in fact see in this context quite a big bleed onto mainstream platforms. And a lot of that racist mobilization and exploitation of COVID still um, have quite a bit of traction into the mainstream um, domains online and needs to be watched. I think, you know, beyond the absolutely sort of clearly overt sort of disinform health disinformation, there's a lot of this manipulation that's happening from uh, interested parties that we again need to be watching, which is slightly more gray area, but nonetheless uh, harmful and, and important um, to watch. We have seen um, them institute, of course, that WhatsApp is instituting more friction in terms of sharing. And so this is you know, yet another step being taken by WhatsApp to make sure that Facebook to make sure that um, that virality around really damaging, harmful content is being checked in some way it's not a silver bullet but it's it slows the process if you like which is an important move around ad policy we've seen big moves around um uh you know blocking of ads around profiteering on hand sanitizer and masks and misinformation around cures but then we've also seen a little bit of backsliding there we have seen some evidence of ads being uh, exploited again sort of exploitative ads around the racist dynamics um, that we're seeing pushed by far-right actors so and some of that getting through the checks of course there are going to be challenges here it's a massive massive undertaking in terms of just the sheer volume um, that's being uh, that's being addressed but just just two things to say we're also looking at 
companies having gone, I, I mean, one thing, there was a kind of admission, a sort of de facto admission that's happened um, around the correlation between online information, disinformation and real world, um, real world problem. Um, so, you know, the, the speed with which they've responded to the 5G attacks, for instance, has been extraordinary. It's also an admission of the link between online and offline harm. And I, and I think that, you know, there's been a lot of pushback to that idea. And, and that may, I think, again, be a conversation that comes back to the fore. Um, as Annalise pointed out, there have been a number of instances, not, not least on the far right, on the extreme right, but of sort of translation of horrible stuff online into, into real world harm that we're now seeing on an ongoing basis that I think will, 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 will start to shape a little bit more the conversation that we're having with the companies. Um, and, and then just around their, their abilities, their capabilities in terms of geolocation and tracking of people, I think it's an interesting one to watch because that has by and large been something that, you know, nobody's, <laughs> the companies haven't wanted to talk too much about, but now we're sort of out in the open as being of great benefit potentially, you know, great benefit in terms of public health um, and tracking the, the spread of the, of the virus. Again, I think we're going to need to think, how does that translate long term in terms of how we think about digital policy and regulation? I think this is a really big challenge for government. Government needs to come in and think, how does that get um, addressed and limited over time so that we aren't in a, in a situation where we're seeing the worst potential impulses of authoritarianism being extended into this online space? Um, I just in terms of um, our approach, I mean, we, we fundamentally believe that the, the, the digital regulation agenda needs to, this is an opportunity for us to think seriously about, uh, you know, what our vision is for a liberal democratic web, the good web. The, the autocrats have their vision for, for, for the web. We haven't really done enough to think about what that big picture vision is, under which then the technocratic moves in Brussels and in member states and so on and in the UK, um, you know, are moving towards a regulatory response. But that bigger picture issue is how do we see liberal democratic values reflected in, uh, in, in platform regulation and policy? I think it's absolutely critical now as that authoritarian impulse comes to the fore and we see that jostling really happening in the sense that Peter has, has defined. Transparency is the name of the game. We push very hard for policies and practice to be shaped around um, meaningful transparency in relation to data mining and usage, in relation to advertising, in, in relation to content moderation, and in, in relation to algorithmic outcomes. I think that remains a requirement that we need to be um, that we need to be uh, really engaging around, as opposed to the more authoritarian, power grabbing, um, and um, if you like. Um, there's a sort of content um, it's suppressing uh, approaches of, of authoritarian states that, that we've seen and that we continue to see. Thanks, Sasha. You really dive deep into, into this issue, but as, as you rightly pointed out, there are many, many uh, aspects uh, and we might uh, think or perhaps this situation could be actually an impulse for, for a much wider discussion, which is long overdue, I believe. Uh, on, on how, how to shape the, the online environment and what should be the role and decision-making processes vis-a-vis -vis social media companies. Uh, now, over to Peter. Uh, let me ask you a question that was uh, raised in the Q&A uh, uh, part of, of the Zoom webinar. What are the current dangers when it comes to instrumentalizing the pandemic for authoritarian ends? On one side, some leaders are imposing state of emergency to enlarge their competencies and cement their grip on power, as you rightly pointed out uh, in the case of Hungary, but there are also other countries. On the other side, some politicians have denied the dangers of the pandemic and hesitantly st started with implementation of measures against the virus for political considerations related to elections, such as in the US or perhaps uh, uh, in the case of Lukashenko in Belarus. So what are the dangers when it comes to instrumentalizing the pandemic uh, for authoritarian ends? I, I think it's a very good question. And, and the interesting response uh, is that, yeah, we, we see these two kinds of dangers. One is the uh, downplaying the, the uh, significance of the, of the pandemic. And the other one is exaggerating it and abusing it to authoritarian ends. And, and uh, we can see in a lot of cases that the same 
politicians who downplayed the importance at the very beginning were the very ones who want to abuse it uh, for authoritarian ends. Uh, one step later, let's say um, Russia is probably a good example for that. Let's see, uh, let's see uh, Belarus as well, because it, they are probably in an earlier phase, but we could see it in, in Hungary as well. I mean, just when the, uh, at the beginning of the coronavirus, uh, Prime Minister Orban told that for Hungary, coronavirus is not the really uh, dangerous. What is a real danger is illegal migration. And then the, in the next, next phase, they combined the, these uh, uh, two threats. Um, I, I would generally say that um, what we can, so authoritarians in power right now, I think we'll face very, uh, very big danger, uh, let's say in half a year or probably one year. So right now we can see that everyone is rallying around the flags in almost all over the world. So all the leaders, even the ones who totally uh, were responding late and wrong, are becoming more popular right now. Because yeah, in, in when politics are, is about life and death, we have this kind of probably authoritarian reflex to stand behind the leader. But when the crisis will turn into a brutal economic recession, I think all the leaders in power will struggle and muddle through this very difficult phase. So I, I would say that in countries where authoritarians are in power, probably they will be on, in the middle term in danger. In countries where uh, these are mainstream democratic politicians on power, they will be in danger. And there, I think populists will have a bigger chance uh, uh, to come uh, to power. And just two short other um, remarks on, on things that what have been already said. I, I wish I could share Graham's optimism about, about the response of the social media companies. And I would raise here one important issue, the, the issue of small languages. Uh, the problem with, with face, Facebook, for example, and fact checkers is that uh, they don't cover really well the s small countries. And for example, for Hungary, there is no, um, no, no uh, dedicated fact checkers. Or Facebook, what does it mean? That for example, in Hungary, uh, Facebook sites with 700,000 followers in a country of 10 million, so it's reaching practically 10% of Facebook users, can spread, for example, anti-vaccination content that directly goes against the, the, uh, the policies of, of Facebook. Still, it can be present because, because nobody removes them. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think uh, right now we can see that, that in, in countries where there are no real dedicated fact checkers, there are much more uh, disinformation in the online domain than it was before. And another thing that will be, I think, a strategic threat for, for, uh, for, for many, and this is what Sa uh, Sasha have um, uh, touched upon a, a bit already, I think because of the rise of this anti-globalization sentiments in all over the world as a result of this pandemic, I think the big companies will be the next huge targets of disinformation campaigns. Some of them, of course, uh, let's say we can say that some of them deserve to be criticized, but what I think we can expect are huge uh, organized disinformation campaigns that can really undermine the reputation of, of, of big companies. And there will be much more demand for such kind of messaging in the general environment when everybody will feel that big companies, the evil ones, are partially responsible for spreading this whole problem and then for the economic recession. Thank you, Peter. I think this makes a very good conclusion of today's discussion. And even though we didn't manage to cover all the issues that were outlined in the very beginning, because as you can see, uh, the infodemic and the use of infodemic by different actors has so many different angles. We could be sitting here for another hour or two, but I hope that this discussion was uh, as interesting for our participants as it was for me. And let me thank all the panelists. Uh, let me thank uh, Graham Brookie, Sasha Havlicek, uh, Anneli Ahonen and Peter Kreko for sharing your thoughts and your insight uh, into uh, the current issues related to COVID infodemic. And let me also thank you from uh, Globsec. And uh, I'm looking forward to future webinars on uh, similar topics and discussions. Thank you all. Have a good thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.